You are listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. He said that by faith. I'm going to move those out of the way so I don't trip as I'm pacing back and forth. There we go. I widen that up for y'all. Can can you see the print? Most of you. <clears throat> so Today, or today, this week was um, very unique, I think, for many. I think on one hand, there is testing in ways that you've not been tested before, but then I, I think it's safe to say that some of you have had blessings this week that you've not had before. Um... Thursday night, um, they had the Sister Womanhood for Good meeting here, and so we, we actually didn't do worship practice, and Mercy Gate was one of the three nonprofits that were up for a grant, and Mercy Gate won. <laughs> and then... Um, Something I've been personally praying and maybe at moments of intercessory whining over was uh, my unsecured debt. Anybody got any unsecured debt? I do. And uh, I have some unsecured debt from the housing market when it busted. Um, I was making a really good living at that point, and I was in Alice in Wonderland believing that it was not going to stop. And it halted very suddenly. And... Uh, I uh, specifically had been paying on a credit card for literally about 10 years now. And I had a significant credit uh, limit on that card because we were doing well then. And um, I got this letter, and and it sat for a couple of days. Well, I opened it Thursday night after we got the news about the grant for Mercygate. And it says, after reviewing your account, we have... uh, made a credit to your account. If this credit is larger than your balance, you'll receive a check. Well, I had to like, this is a credit card company, people. I mean, this is like the IRS contacting you, telling you they made a mistake. Doesn't happen much. And so I call because I'm going to make a payment on this credit card. And I'm going to be totally transparent with my debt. All you Dave Ramsey and Danny Johnson people, just... Throttle down. I know. That's not good. And uh, my previous balance, no judgment, was still $3,800. And when I called Thursday night for the balance, my balance was $396. I got a $3,400 credit on my credit card for apparently absolutely no reason except for prayer. Because over a year now, I've been praying, and I confessed my irresponsibility of spending from years ago, and I asked the Lord for mercy. And I've honestly been praying and asking for supernatural debt relief. And if that's not an answer to that prayer, it is. And so, and then my brother had been fighting for trying to get an insurance check for two months, and the day after that, he got it. Then, uh, then, Be- then Becky... Uh, just got notified yesterday of a check that will carry her second month of child care for Asher. And so there are, um, there, there are significant breakthroughs happening in this season. There is pushback. And so l- let, me, let me help you with the issue of spiritual warfare. Wherever your past weaknesses are, that will be the target of the attack. Period. The enemy's not going to, like, he, he doesn't have a, a whole lot of ideas, 
because we're not that sharp a lot of times. <laughs> Usually, his, what he uses works, right? Yeah. Or at least it will, it will wear you down. And that's one of his strategies is to try to wear down the saints. I feel like one of the things corporately that we as a body here are breaking is the python spirit over this region. The python spirit is a religious spirit. And you, many of you, uh, let me ask you this. Are there moments lately, especially over the last two or three weeks, that you felt squeezed? Like just you're like tired, you're fatigued, and your, your desire to read has lessened. Your, your desire to be in prayer has lessened. That is an attack from the python spirit. Everybody thinks that like the python spirit is simply the spirit of divination found in Acts 16. But there's more than one type of constriction of the enemy. And so when you begin to find yourself losing desire to read, losing desire to worship, losing desire to spend time in prayer, losing desire to be in fellowship, those are immediate signs that you're under attack from a python spirit. Now, I hate snakes. And if I had a bazooka gun in the spirit, I would just blow them all up and be done with it. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. And so, um, like in the midst of all this blessing, I like hit a wall yesterday morning and I said something. Lisa's like, you know, that's really stupid that you're word cursing your destiny. I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. That was stupid. (laughs) What are you going to say? Because I was like, I was complaining, and I'm like, why am I complaining? We're like, I mean, things are amazing. I, so we probably lost 30 people last week when I said an inappropriate word, please forgive me, publicly this week. Um, sometimes my humanity shows up, and uh, some of you are still back, so that's good. Um, but this, I hear you, bub. There's this theme this whole week in my heart that the, Lord, the Lord's been speaking about the issue of humility. And as, as you study Acts, you study the Gospels, you study first century church, and you study the life of the apostles, you study the life of Moses, there's a theme that you'll find that the men of God that were used to the greatest degree are the men and women of God that had the greatest measure of the glory of God resting on their life were men and women of humility. And this, yep, this is going good already. (laughs) This issue of humility, I I think has been significantly misunderstood. I think that um, what we believe humility is has been misunderstood. I think that many times our pride masquerades as false humility. Let me, let me try to explain on this side. Um, so, when someone, like, praises you, you know, the spiritual thing to do, oh, it was all the Lord. Well, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that good. <laughs> Who, somebody, somebody, somebody told me they said that. He's like, it wasn't that good. So, there, do you understand what I'm saying? There's a co-laboring here in the kingdom. There's a co-laboring God with you, and sometimes people get you, right? And so, but I know this, that the greater the measure of humility that you carry in your life, you're going to create a culture or an atmosphere in your life that will literally just be like a magnet to the presence of God. And... Something very beautiful happened Tuesday morning in my office. Um, I was ministering to an 11-year-old boy. His mother brought him, and he was was pretty, you know, I mean, he's 11, and he didn't really feel like talking about a whole lot, and so I was trying to figure out what he would engage, what he wouldn't, and just tried to be real tender, and a little here, a little there, we'd get a couple prayers in, and and uh, towards the end of the session, I, the Lord showed me he was creative. And so I began to show him all the prophetic art in our office on the walls, right? And um, in the midst of that, 
he, had, he really had been um, missing his dad, right? And that was part of the, I mean, the kid was fighting depression and heaviness, and it was all back to the fact that his, that his earthly father didn't want anything to do with him. And I began to pray for this young boy, and <laughs> Becky was at her desk there in the, in the little foyer there, and uh, I, I, joke in, I joke around, our office is either an open heaven or a war room, like it's just one or the other. So if you come, just know, either you might fall out or you might need to get your helmet, one or the other. And, and I begin to pray over this 11-year-old, and I just started asking the Lord to fill him with joy, right? Because joy is the opposite of depression. And as I was praying over him, all of a sudden... I just felt the strong impartation go into his heart, and he goes out cold. Paul was behind him, and he's laying on the tile, I mean, totally out. Not a little bit out, he's gone for about 20 minutes. So what do you do during those 20 minutes while an 11-year-old's out like a light on your tile? Well, if you're Justin, I got a cup of coffee. <laughs> And then we just kind of hung out, and I could see all these lights over him, so I knew there was a lot of stuff going on. And he comes, he pops up, well, not pops up, he kind of, you know, after you get hit like that, you're kind of got sailor's feet. And, and, he, and this kid's up, and I go, so what happened, man? And he just looks at me, and he goes, I went to heaven. Like, I'm not going to write a book about this. <laughs> Not going to do a world tour. I went to heaven. I said, really? Well, what would you see? Because I saw my grandma there. She had recently died in the last year. And I said, what would grandma say to you? And uh, he said, nothing. She, I just saw her. And he goes, and I saw God. I said, really? I said, what did God look like? We well, had this dark, long hair, dark beard. I said, what did his eyes look like? And I began to ask him about what God looked like. I said, well, what did God tell you? And the boy says, be nice to your mother. And, see, he had, not been, he, he had not been being nice. He had not been honoring his mother. And this boy, the Lord moved on my heart for us as a ministry to bless them because she's a single mother of three. And when he was good, he got to play video games for 30 minutes a day on her phone. Um, I asked mom's permission for this first, but I said, well, can we get you like an iPad or something for all the kids to share? And this kid pops up, and he goes, well, we'd like an, he goes, I'd like a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and thankfully, it was actually cheaper, so I was like, sure, buddy. <laughs> and so we, we went and went to GameStop and got him a, a Nintendo Switch, and it just radically changed his family, not the game, obviously, the Nintendo, but, but just loving on people and watching God move. The reason why I mention that, and you're like, what in the world does him going to heaven have to do with humility, is there's children encountering God in ways that we would love to, but because we don't have the humility in our lives the way children do, it doesn't happen. A kid can go from having an open vision or an encounter and literally legitimately have a heavenly experience. And in two blinks, this child can go outside and play with his friends and think, and just, that's just cool. Yeah, it's all God. Yep. Are, you, are y'all with me? Jesus said, unless you become as a little child, you won't enter into the kingdom. Here's the problem. The enemy beats the living snot out of us as kids, and then we reject ourselves and suppress our hearts our whole lives, and we fight to get back to living from our hearts where true humility and childlike faith lies. And if you believe the lie that you're still a sinner and that your heart is still evil and and, and cannot be trusted at all, then you believe a lie. Because Scripture says you've been given a new heart, a new spirit, and you're no longer a sinner. You're now a son and daughter who sins sometimes. Hopefully not as much this week as last week. 
If you have your Bibles, go to Philippians 2, 1 to 11. Should have put my mascara on this morning. The lights are a little bright. My face not washing out. You only got to put up with me for a few minutes, folks. Okay, Philippians 2, 1 to 11. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God highly exalted him and bestowed him on, uh, I'm sorry, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God. So now, if I don't get back to my power, my, my outline here, <laughs> we started out right. James 4.10 says, Humble yourself before the Lord and He'll exalt you. Pride is literally the enemy of humility. Pride is at the root of most issues. Um... Not Friday night, the previous Friday night, we were doing a Friday night worship, and what really started triggering this whole humility thing was I had something that night happen to me personally that I've not had happen in a very long time, and that was this, Um, a a young man, I say young man, he's younger than me, Jonah Prio came up to me, and if y'all know that Jonah and Faith have got baby Judah, and, and he's... I mean, that we've fought in prayer and intercession uh, for, for his life the whole way through. And they're still believing for a miracle. Jonah said, can I do something, man? He goes, can I wash your feet? And the last time I had my feet washed was like in 2008 um, at an axe retreat, which is real similar to like a walk to Emmaus. And it messed me up. Like, it was harder for me to have my feet washed than to wash somebody's feet. And as, as he's washing my feet in the back, I'm like, I'm, I'm just getting all sorts of jacked up. I'm, tears are coming down, and, I'm, I'm, and I literally just see the picture of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. See, we've been called to a life that was absolutely shown to us by the Lord himself. There's absolutely nothing that the Lord has required of us that he didn't model while on the earth. The ultimate manifestation of humility is when God emptied himself, set aside, limited himself, and became fully human. And and he'll never take off that humanity. Like, he became human... Forever. Are you, are you with me? Yeah. In the beginning was God, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, right? So God robed Himself in flesh. And then He says that He didn't come to be served, but to serve and offer His life a ransom. So, why in the world, in the Western church, do we have this me mentality? You realize right now in Egypt and in Africa and all over the earth, there are literally people walking for miles, for miles to get to church. And then they will worship all day. And then they will literally walk miles to get home. And they do that every week. And many of them don't even have shoes on. But then we in the Western church, 
Many times, if something's just not quite right, we'll go check out another one. There's a hundred churches in Kerrville alone. I'm not saying you have to walk to church here to be spiritual. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we're fixing to do a foot washing because I've seen some of y'all's toes. <laughs> Sorry. That may be one more in the book I shouldn't repeat. Um, but no. And I was thinking about this foot washing deal and literally thinking, I mean, like, I'm seeing Jesus in my mind's eye, washing the disciples' feet, and he said he set an example for us. Think about that. What in the world was it like if, if you were one of the disciples to literally be sitting there and the Lord is washing your feet? Peter goes, no, you're not going to wash my feet. He says, if I don't wash your feet, you can't go with me. He goes, well, then, Lord, not my feet, my whole body. Why? Well, that was Peter. I probably relate more with him in moments. Uh, Yep, we'll just keep going. Self-promotion is rooted in pride and is like the sin of witchcraft. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. You know, when we embrace biblical humility... It, it really is powerful. When, when, when you're in a place of humility and somebody attacks you and you recognize that God is the one that vindicates your name, that you don't have to vindicate your name, that's so freeing. Do, do you understand? When, when, when you recognize that no matter what people say about you, like we're coming, we, we've been having complaints about the restaurant because we painted it white. Literally. People are complaining that we're trying to fix up Ingram. (laughs) But the other dude that just opened up a donut shop in a trailer has had zero complaints. For real, y'all. The sheriff came to the restaurant to let us know about this and we had to go to the city hall. For real. I'm, and so, you're, and let me tell you something. The people that usually scream the loudest are doing the least. That's the truth. Usually, the people that are complaining the most are doing the least. So, yeah, you could say, you could get all fired up and be like, I want to pluck their feathers. And, 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 and get torqued. But then again, there's this example where Jesus sat there and it says he opened not his mouth. The, I mean, the ultimate mocking, they put a crown of thorns and they drive it into his head. They spit on him. They beat him beyond recognition. He looked worse than what you saw in the Passion. And yet he didn't say anything. And yet throughout the Scriptures you see all these men like Stephen and, and, and Peter who at the end of his life refused to be crucified the way Jesus was because he wasn't worthy to die the way that his Lord died. And so he, he was crucified upside down. There's actually a book called The Power of Humility by R.T. Kendall and what was hilarious was he wanted to name the book uh, Pride, the sin that no one talks about. And the, because he has another book called Jealousy, the sin that nobody talks about. And, uh, and that's, you know, pretty well true. Um, and he argued with Destiny Image. And, and he was offended with them because they didn't want to name the book what he wanted to name it. And then he, the Lord said, that's because you're prideful. It is absolutely impossible to get offended with another human being without a stronghold. Do you understand that? If you get offended with somebody else, that just simply points to a stronghold in your life. 
And in that stronghold, you're going to find pride. He rewards fruitfulness with pruning, right? So I felt fruitfulness this week, and I felt pruning this week because as I get a now word from the Lord, as Lord willing, as I speak, I I get to experience that word for myself. (sighs) And there were some things not going the way that I wanted them to, and then I was complaining about it, And the truth was, the Lord revealed my heart, it was because it was bigger than me, and I wasn't in control of it. Ah, yeah. Everybody wants to make a huge impact on the earth, but they want to be in control of the process, and it does not work that way. If God calls you to the impossible, you can't control the impossible, because then there it would not be impossible. If you try to control living in the supernatural realm of, it, of all things are possible, but yet you want to govern the direction of impossible, then you no longer live in impossible. You live with an earthly mindset and not the mind of Christ. Pride left unchecked will always lead to being humbled, period. Any area of your life that you are arrogant or prideful or boastful, God is going to humble you. And you can choose a private humbling or a public humbling, but God will humble you. It says if you humble yourselves, but, but that just listen, best thing to do is always humble yourself. Let God exalt you. Let Him lift you up. Listen, When God exalts a man or a woman, they don't have to spend the rest of their life protecting their reputation. It says, pride goes before destruction. It's okay, remain calm, people. The internet may be out again like last night. Let's try this one more time. No kids are in the uh, back closet, are they? Ah, Praise the Lord. Yeah, we lost. uh... That's okay. We'll just keep preaching. All right. Hang with me. That's, that's like the glory sign behind me with the apple. So, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride guarantees correction. A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. So, if you want to carry honor in your life, it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the the honor or the glory of a king to search it out. If, if you want honor in your life, then you got to have humility. You can't, we can't demand favor with people. You understand that? Like pride will demand a position among people. Pride will say, you need me and how can I help you? Whereas humility is going to say, hey man, I see that there's, there's a need for help here. How can I serve? I can tell you that with, with, with our ministry and our leadership, we, we, are, we are constantly looking for people with a true servant's heart. And, and that's growing here. That's being cultivated here. And, we're, and I'm, I'm watching people just step up and come forward and say, hey, can I do this? And somebody, just came, uh, Gilda came to me this morning and said, hey, would it be okay if we started a corporate intercession group? I said, absolutely. And so we're going to be getting, getting an announcement out next week for that. that if, 
Those that are greatest in the kingdom are servants of all. Then, if there's not service in your life, from heaven's perspective, you're not great. That went over like... I said, if there's not service in your life, then from heaven's perspective, you're not great. Listen, too too many times, do, do you understand that you can perceive something to be good and be absolutely convinced that it's good, but it's from hell? Eve said she looked at the tree and it was good. And she saw good on the tree. John Bevere wrote a book about that entire subject because the Holy Spirit spoke to him one day. And he says, it's not the blatant evil that are taking people to hell, but it's the perceived good. There's a way that seems right. There's a way that seems good unto men, but in the end it leads to death. Because remember, it's the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and what? The pride of life. So, out of the pride of life, you can end up going down a path that appears to be good, that's good among men, and that makes you wise, but it leads to destruction. I think we might have something back up here. There was a, a significant fiber cut last night, or yesterday. That's why all the uh, internet went down, cell phones and everything. Okay. So, now listen to this. This is what's going to mess you up. Hang in there with me. Pride is a lack of the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 8.13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance in the evil way and the perverse mouth I hate. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride. So pride causes hardening. But when his heart was lifted up, and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. That's Daniel 5.20. Nebuchadnezzar became so prideful that God brought him low. And he literally was changed into like, an, like literally like a beast. His, his nails grew, his hair became like feathers. He was eating the grass. And he was told how, like how long this would happen. And then his kingdom was restored to him. And because of that humbling, Nebuchadnezzar said, Well, now I know that God is able to bring low any man. Because you have to understand, something in that culture was a lot of times the people thought these kings were actually gods. This is during a time when when Daniel was renamed by the king by one of the gods that he served. And like we talked last week, uh, Daniel didn't start throwing a religious fit. He didn't march and he didn't get a bullhorn and do all this stuff. He, He, like Lance Wallnow, he was like a ninja sheep. Lance calls people like that ninja sheep. Uh, sorry, I thought that was funny. And uh, because he goes in there, or what we would call Jehovah Sneaky, and he goes in there and he allows God's favor on his life and the skill that the Lord had given him, because remember they were found ten times greater, ten times better than the Chaldeans. And once he was in a position of influence, Then when it was asked about him why he wouldn't bow with boldness, he said, why? Some of you are trying to speak a message with no platform because you've not humbled yourself to go through the process to step into your destiny. That was quiet. We cannot demand respect from people, but we can live a life of character 
that people will see and they'll automatically respect it. We can't demand, like I try to demand my kids to respect me at moments. Like last night, I was about to speak in tongues. I was, we, internet was out. This is like a serious time in history. We got a blackout going on. And we're trying to carry on a meeting for the restaurant. And, and Cole keeps coming in and, 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 you know, he's 13. So he, he uh, and I go, Cole, can, can, you, can you please go so we can finish the meeting? And so then he just goes to another seat and then stares at me. I was like, no, Cole, please, come on, buddy. Would you please go? So he goes to another part of the kitchen and still stares at me eating food. And I'm like, we are about to have some five-fold ministry going on. <laughs> and our poor business partners about saw another side of the anointing. It was called J.C. Penney's. <laughs> but he was okay, didn't he? He left. Don't be mad at me because I just said that. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. You understand, that all throughout the Old Covenant, the one thing the Lord was looking for was humility, that man would humble himself. And that one of the things David said was that he humbled himself through fasting. He said, and he actually described himself in the Psalms at one point that from even humbling himself to such a degree that he was fasting for his enemies. And we talked on that. Like, when's the last time you fasted for your enemy? I'm telling y'all, if we actually, like, if we line up with the word and we start loving our enemies the way Jesus said to, you're going to win some of your enemies into the kingdom. Like, if you want to shrink your enemies, love them. Proverbs says it's like heaping hot coals on their head. When they're acting like a jackknife, you turn around and you bless them. The problem is we want to vindicate our name. The problem is we want revenge when they, when they hurt us, when they trespass into our lives. Humility goes out the door and we pull out the sword like Peter and take their ear off. Because we go, how dare they come against me that way? Who in the world do they think they are? Do they not know what I'm doing for the kingdom? Do they not know how I pray? How I read. Right? I mean, at least some of y'all are thinking that in your heart, maybe. But yet, Stephen the martyr was being stoned to death, and he goes, God, forgive them. Please don't hold this sin against them. As you look out through the book of Acts, it went from addition to multiplication, right? It went from addition to multiplication. That was the growth pattern over a 15-year period. But around Acts 9 or, or 10, they actually hit a place to where there was peace. There was peace. They, they got out of persecution, and they actually multiplied in the midst of peace. And, and what's hilarious was I saw this verse a few weeks ago, and then Bill Johnson preached on this, on this subject a couple of weeks after that. And, and, of course, it's Bill, so you like need to listen to it five times. And, but it said it was the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They multiplied in the fear of the Lord, right? So if humility is the absence of the fear of the Lord and they flourished in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that means instead of puffing up with pride when things didn't go their way, they chose the comfort of the Holy Spirit rather than their revenge on man. Job 33, 14 to 17 says, For God may speak in one way or in another, yet man does not perceive it. In a dream and a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, 
while slumbering on their beds. Then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from him. So if you want to know why some of you can't remember your dreams, it simply may be that if God showed you your future right now, you might swell up with pride. That's why you get deja vu. Because all of a sudden, you walk out your future that was instilled into you in the night watch, and you're like, I've been here before. Because you were in the night. And then it was concealed from you, and then you found yourself walking it out. That's what deja vu is. It's literally dream fragments of your future that were instilled into your spirit that guides you on your path that you should go And then at the same time, it's hidden from you on a conscious level so that you don't swell up with pride. You with me? And then there's the other side of things. For me, if God would have shown me I was going to have to plant a church, there would have been a big whale. Some of you may have run. I'm almost done. Hang in there. So, pride is actually what caused Lucifer himself to fall. So you might say that if we're full of pride, we're more like Lucifer than we are Jesus. It said, how have you fallen, O heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How have you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven... I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mountain of the congregation of the farthest side of the north. Where is heaven? It's the farthest side of the north. Scripture gives hints about due north, true north, the farthest side of north, that that's where where God's throne room is, where the third heaven is. And he says, "I uh, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. That was just like all arrogance. It was all pride. Of every, he thought he could take out God. He could be just like him. First uh, Timothy 3.6 says this, Not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So in other words, premature promotion is the potting soil of pride. One of the things is that as we go through process then it brings humility. And then humility allows us to be blessed without being judged for the blessing. Does that make sense? So, let me finish up on humility versus pride. You like my outline up there? It looks pretty cool. The greatest measure of humility can normally be found in a child. We talked about this earlier. Children can literally go to heaven and then go play. It says, Matthew 23, 12, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So, at the end of the day, the kingdom is about paradoxes. You do absolutely opposite of what you would think you should do, and you get the result that you desire. So, if you want to go up, you've got to go low. If you want to be great, you become servant of all. Listen, as we allow repentance its proper place in our life, that is what cultivates humility. Humility comes with repentance. If we refuse to repent in an area of our life, it's because of pride. It's because we think that our way is better than God's. Right? Isaiah 66, 2. All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. 
But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So a humble spirit actually attracts the presence of God. So you become a landing pad for the glory of God as you embrace humility. Listen, one of the, one of the hardest things in the world for, for prophetic people to do is admit that they were wrong when they prophesied. They will look for excuse after excuse to justify, well, maybe it was just the timing. Maybe we need more time. <laughs> or maybe you blew it. If you're prophetic in nature, let me, let me give you a little key here. Take responsibility for the words that you prophesy. And when you miss it, you repent from the same platform that you release the word from. And if you actually show that level of humility in your life and accountability, then you're actually going to be trusted with greater words that will shift more than just an individual's life. You'll actually grow in the arena of prophecy. And that's this, the whole process of those that are called to the office of a prophet, are actually, it, a big part of that process is humility and maturity and stewarding what God's give them, and they only say what God says to say. They don't add to it. They don't take away from it. And when they speak prematurely or they speak soulishly, they take responsibility for that word, and the exact opposite will happen to your life. The exact opposite will happen. When people see that you're taking responsibility for the words that come out of your mouth, and you actually you take accountability for it, you repent when you need to repent, then that will actually grow a greater measure of trust with those around you because then they'll know that when you mess up, you're going to come to them instead of trying to cover yourself so that you look extra spiritual. And one of the things as a prophetic community we want to cultivate is humility and honor as we declare what we believe the Lord is saying into someone's life. You're literally handling their life. Their life is in your hands. And when you claim to hear from God, you claim to know the future of a human being, you better darn well know their future, and you better have humility in the midst of it and say, this is what I believe the Lord's saying to you right now, rather than trying to look good in front of others because that's pride and self-promotion. Last verse. In conclusion... Numbers 12, 3 says this. Be, um, now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. I absolutely believe with all my heart it was because of the humility of Moses the Lord was able to speak to him face to face. If you desire a life full of encounters with the Lord, then you have to align your life with his priorities then that means that we have to value what he values. We have to love what he loves. We have to align our lives completely with the Holy Spirit. We've got to embrace humility. We've got to embrace character. And you have to understand that as you pursue a life of love, a life of character, that as you are more concerned with the fruit coming out of your life than how many people fall on the ground when you pray for them, everything changes in that moment. Your giftings will automatically grow Because now you've got a platform and a foundation to steward that type of glory resting on your life. If I can get the prayer teams to come forward. Listen, my heart, my heart for all of us is that we will absolutely step into an arena that many have not been since the first century. I absolutely believe that God's restoring all things. I absolutely believe that we're getting back to that that anointing and authority that rests on the first century church. But in order for us to get there, we've we've, we've got to be willing for the sanctification process to go deep in our lives so that we can steward it. Elizabeth, oh, you're on the prayer team. Is your does that work still? 
Can you play some music? Listen, I just want to encourage y'all. If the Lord's highlighted something in your life today, don't minimize it. Don't think, oh, well, I I just was thinking about that. That was just something I was thinking about. Recognize that when God's word is brought to you, that it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. It's not man's job to change our lives. It's our job to love each other. That's your job, to love people where they're at, no matter how much you agree or disagree with their life. You love them, and you allow the Holy Spirit to change them. So don't leave here thinking about something that came to your heart and your mind and minimizing that because you're going to end up quenching the Holy Spirit. God wants to touch you and bring revelation into your life. He wants to bring change. He wants to bring maturity. It is God's will to bless you. And some of y'all have got to deal with offenses. Some of you have got to let go of the reins. I, during worship, I literally, I could feel like in the spirit of what felt like straps behind me. Like I was trying to pull something. And I'm like, Lord, what in the world am I trying to pull? And I realized it was in the spirit, it was like a wagon train. And it was a prophetic word over my life about the ministry. And I'm literally like trying to pull it. And I'm like, well, no wonder I'm tired. I'm like, Lord, forgive me for grabbing the reins again. Take the reins. And, I, and towards the end, when it crescendoed and we got the breakthrough, I just started crying. And I could feel all that yoke and all the, all the weight that, that hinders us fall off of my shoulders. So don't leave here carrying stuff. I almost said something else. Hallelujah. The Greek word... Pradola. <laughs> you don't have a right to stay wounded. Do you know that? Like if you know the Lord, you don't have a right to stay wounded. You have a right to walk in freedom. You have a right to walk in wholeness. We don't have a right for offense. We don't have a right for unforgiveness. We have a right for forgiveness. We have a right for freedom. We have a right for love. We have a right for authority. We have a right for power. We have a right for inheritance. If, if you want to kill giants, then you need to hang around giant killers. You know the old saying, it's hard to fly with the eagles if you're surrounded by turkeys. This is a house of eagles. So, well, Father, I just ask that you bless this time. Lord, if, if there's anybody in this house that doesn't know you, Lord, the way that we've talked about you today, God, convict them. Open their eyes, Lord. Open their heart. Let them see their need for you, Jesus. Bless everybody here, Lord. Bless their families. Lord, open their eyes to see what you want them to see today. Minister to them. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would fill this house to a greater measure tangibly, Lord. And that everyone would walk out of here changed from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.